Hello, everybody. Well done, Margaret. Well done, Jim. Well done, Father Dara. Um, we are grateful to be together. We are grateful to hear a little baby crying in the background. How many moms heard that? <clears throat> Gives us all hope and joy. Now, we're, today, we're here today for two reasons. The past and the future, as Margaret said. We're here to mark the demolition of one building and ask for a blessing on the construction of another. We connect this project, the work of our hands, to an acute awareness of the goals of the supernatural, the Holy Spirit. Many have lost the awareness of the connection between their daily work and God's hopes. And perhaps it's to be expected. Even a sign of making room for the return of the good thing. Maybe the good thing will be a closer connection to the scriptural Christ, whom we, as Christians, follow. Because while this building that is coming down was built in Christian hope and with the best of intentions, it came to represent trauma to some, a, a spiritual betrayal even, a soul wound. The building going up represents the supernatural response to that reality. It, uh, we feel God's right to reply. You and I are offering God the right to reply. The Holy Spirit, if we pray at all, extends to us the privilege of spiritual goals and tasks in every well-lived life, sometimes in each day, there will be many supernatural goals for us. Some of these goals will be costly. Often we cannot fathom why a task is so hard, uh, why it's important for us to achieve it. And some of God's goals come wrapped in so many layers of mystery that it's not till much later that it all starts to make sense. And we're glad that we persevered. Isn't that true? Often you can only understand God's beautiful craftsmanship looking back on your life. Now consider a young couple, they're handed a baby. The most sublime and important spiritual goal any of us could ever receive. The young couple is used to a lifestyle that includes sleep. <laughs> when the baby comes, it changes. The couple's up through the night, every night, night after night, and fatigue sets in. Financial challenges, the demands increase. They face exhaustion, worry, uncertainty. Everything is different. But what doesn't change? The goal. Tend to the new little person. The goal does not change. So the parents must. The goal, my friends, is what changes the people. When heaven is involved in a goal, as with every new baby, we have to stretch. Sometimes we have to walk away from what we think our life was going to look like, and we have to um, accept the reality of what our life has come to be so that we don't miss the joy in it. The men who built this building built it to serve God, to glorify God in their time. The new one represents the exact same thing. But our spiritual, supernatural goals are for people in this time. We will all have to change to be worthy of, of those goals. We'll have to stretch. Now, who was Christ and why do we follow him? Well, we look obviously to scripture. Christ looked at a woman about to be stoned for adultery. And he said to the mom, okay, let you who is without the first sin throw the first stone. They went away, beginning with the elders. After that, he said to the woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, 
she said. Neither do I condemn you. That's from John chapter 7. Jesus is saying to the woman, change your life, little lady. This isn't good for you. He's saying to the mob, you're the same as this woman. He's showing her you are indistinguishable from your peers and the, these people who condemn you. He's saying to all of them, stop isolating people who make the same mistakes you make or that you have made in the past or that you are making right now. He's very, very pointedly saying at the same time, I don't condemn any of you. That's why we go to scripture. I wonder, my friends, I just wonder, perhaps we wonder together, if Holy Communion had been available then, would they have excluded her from it for her apparent sexual sin? I think the church elders would have excluded her. And the people felt justified in the condemnation because the elders were there, participating. They were all about to kill her. What is relevant to us as Christians is this. Would Christ have excluded her? What would Christ have done there? Based on his actions on that day, I don't think so. I don't think so. It's clear that they all needed an encounter with him. Every one of them. Every one of us. The mob needed to meet themselves in the mirror and see themselves, how they looked in the gaze of Christ. Not good. They didn't look good. Christ, even at that time, communicated ultimate authority. Jesus Christ is the ultimate authority. The woman needed to meet with divine understanding and love and dignity. And we need that same thing. And Christ died to give that to us. Isn't that beautiful? I believe in this story we can locate the first hope for renewal in our Catholic faith. A more accurate and complete understanding of sin and far more importantly, mercy. Many of the people whom, you think about this with me, many of the people whom we can grab on technicalities technically not in compliance with our teachings, look very saintly to me. Is it the same for you? Can you see the holiness in some of the people who aren't technically correct in our faith? Yes or no? Absolutely. Many who appear to be in technical compliance with our teachings behave in a humanly despicable manner. Isn't it true? Okay. What should we do about that? What do we do about that? Continue to ignore it? Not talk about it? Continue to ignore the differences between the spirit and the letter of the law? Our teachings are full of light and truth, but we seem a little bit too complacent to break them down, to be curious about them, to apply the scriptural Christ to them. Courage. If we've gotten something wrong, we simply repair it, right? We move to repair. In this new building, we'll, we'll try to do that. We teach our catechism more fully to help reduce judgment and self-hatred. Promote critical thinking so people can love themselves as Christ loves them. Scripture tells us, love your neighbor as yourself. And someone once said, well, how do you do that when you don't even like yourself? Isn't that a good question? Pointedly, nobody should be telling anybody that they will go to hell if this or that condition isn't met. It's an inflation to think you can do this. Anybody, only Jesus Christ, can accurately and fully offer judgment about a soul of a human being his Father created. The Father himself judges no one, but has assigned all judgment to the Son, from John. Peter himself made... Is everyone okay? I'm giving this as I wrote it because despite the 45-minute news that Mamal Jim and I didn't get, <laughs> I feel I want to offer you my thoughts, okay? Yes. All right. Peter himself made a lot of mistakes. Poor St. Peter. Who would like to go down in history for making the most mistakes of all the apostles? The first pope. 
Um, he had a lot of good ideas, but they were shot down as he learned to properly discern the spirit of the Savior. He wanted to build three tents after the transfiguration. Seemed like a good idea. Christ said no. In the garden, he assaulted a soldier to protect Jesus. It seemed like a good idea. Christ said, that's not what we're going to do, Peter. Christ um, indicated that wasn't the way for him. Peter got so confused and afraid after they arrested Jesus that he even denied knowing him. When might you and I be denying that we know Christ? That is our question to ask and answer. Peter made mistakes. Peter learned. There was room for him to learn. And there's room for you and I to learn. The second hope for renewal might be found in a decreasing clericalism. Jesus said in Matthew 20, You know that the rulers of this world lord it over people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. My friends, clericalism is bullying. That's all. Clericalism is why people got away with crimes. Clericalism is why so many ministries and gospel efforts are shut down. Clericalism continues to be under-challenged, partially because we love so passionately the saintly men who serve as priests to us. Isn't that true? We don't want to hurt them, so we, we don't want to say anything to them. But we're going to have to handle this. Um, the, the, the priests who continue to serve in these ugly times, uh, they don't seek celebrity status. They would not accept it. They leave in the night to tend to the dying, and they rise in the morning and celebrate Mass for us. And they do this quietly while their vocations are pelted with disrespect. So we need to cop ourselves on there, make sure they're okay. There are others who are not like these holy men, though. There are others who seek to be treated as celebrities and cultivate special status. And there are lay people only too happy to bestow it on them. So let's take responsibility. We feel immense gratitude for the priesthood, for those who stand in a self-imposed shallow to help protect our relationship with God. In the last story, the elders were the first to disperse. Christ exposed them. One thing a bully doesn't like is exposure. Perhaps we can all do better in challenging uh, clericalism and the people in the clergy who bully other priests and who bully us. The third hope for renewal, I think, is to be found in the integration of feminine leadership. I would say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> would I advise any woman to step into a leadership role in the church? I don't think advice is the right word. I would implore every woman to get involved in service to the church. We cannot leave because it is too hard. We cannot give up when our intuitive way of preaching the gospel is rejected. When a supernatural goal given to us does not change, we have to change. Disillusionment is not a luxury we can afford. Too much is at stake. Nations rise and fall, and our church's credibility also rises and falls. If there is a new time coming, and there always will be, uh, what must be carried forward? What is it that we cannot do without, that we want for our children and our grandchildren? The presence of Jesus Christ on earth, physically, truly, in the Eucharist, is, has been entrusted to the Catholic Church. We are assembled around the Eucharist, the presence of God, the chair of Peter, sits under the direct authority of Jesus Christ. What each one of us does, to some degree, will determine if our lineage will have the benefit of Christ truly present among them. The Eucharist has to be carried forward into the new time for the whole world, not just for Catholics. You don't have to receive the Eucharist to benefit from its presence. We Catholics are charged with protecting, defending, and ensuring that Christ can remain present and available in this physical, supernatural way. Do we believe in the presence of Christ in the Eucharist, yes or no? Yes. We do. That should show up in our life. The supernatural goal will not change, but some of us will have to. 
if we're going to protect it. In our apostolate, we ask people to sit, sit, sit before the tabernacle in any church. The goal is simple, accompany Christ. The goal doesn't change, but what changes those people change when they sit before Christ. By and large, they say they're loved, they feel loved. And it gives them a kind of a curiosity about the sacraments. My friends, I guess in short, nobody should pretend they can get between any human being and God. Nobody can, no teaching, no rule, no person, no, no church assembly. Only Jesus can fully judge. And he said, neither do I condemn you. So am I saying there's no condemnation? Not at all. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that Christ always wants to be with you. It will be we who separate ourselves from Christ. If we have any desire to be in relationship with Christ personally right now, that is his greatest hope. Why confession? Because it heals us. It's a spiritual grace of acceptance that we benefit from. We Sacraments are visible signs of an invisible grace. It's real, we just can't see it, like the wind. That's what a sacrament is according to our catechism. If we're moving from one definitive time period in our church to another, what must be carried forward? We need the papacy intact. We need the hierarchical structure of the church intact. How will we keep that intact when the contraction of the priesthood and the faithful is so severe and seemingly unstoppable? We need to protect the ordained men we have and we need an infusion of lay leadership men and women. Again, get involved. Get involved. We need a renewed commitment to the scriptural example of Jesus Christ to be credible, my friends. I think really that's it. We are Christians. We are his followers, and he loves us. We need to know him. We need to know scripture. He forgives our mistakes. He forgave Peter's mistakes. The people coming back, and they are returning. People are returning, but they need formation in order not to be scandalized, confused or misled. And that's what we're going to do here. We don't want people disillusioned when they return. Um, people must understand the Catholic Church as the home of the Eucharist, God truly present. They need to view the Church as a servant to something that can never be taken away from them. Their direct connection to God. These are supernatural goals. There's mystery. There's beautiful mystery. If we embrace these goals, we'll have to change. My friends, we have hope. We are not slaves to the way the church was in the past or even to the way the church is in the present. But we must become servants to the way our church needs to develop for the future. We must become servants to the supernatural presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. And that is why we stay, yes? All of us together. Yes. Uh, recognizing Jerry Cusack, picture below. He was a, a, the abbot here. He was a great friend to, uh, to me and to Father Dara. We recognize a couple of people, Tricia Flatley for sure, and Eustace Mita, and, and some of our friends. So I uh, recognize everyone who made this place look so beautiful. Well done. It's gorgeous, especially the grotto. Okay, thank you guys.